Um, so thanks for the introduction, Yanis, and thank you also to Helen and Gert and everybody who's been involved in organizing this. Um, I've been learning a lot uh, yesterday, especially. I've tried to put some of that into the slides today. Um, but just wanted to start out also mentioning in this introduction um, that Yanis gave of me that the topic of this conference is very much not my own focus. Um, and so I was reflecting a little bit, like, what do I have to say in terms of you know, subversive potential of blockchains for artists, um, kind of relating back to that theme, and share some, some related research that I did, uh, but with a bit of a backstory, so bear with me. Um, it all kind of started once upon a time um, with me on the internet. You gotta imagine me a little bit younger, around 2021, 20, um, growing back pains, and I was reading online as one does, uh, and kept coming across these sort of news articles here in Art Basel talking about the NFT revolution. Um, another one in Forbes, how NFTs are revolutionizing the arts. The Goethe Institute was talking about it. There was revolutionary events about NFTs happening. Um, Artnet was wondering, here's the factors that we need for the revolution. And yes, I even engaged with strangers on Reddit to discuss the revolutionary potential of these new technologies. Um, now, I'm not an artist, I'm not an art expert, I'm not an art history scholar or any of that, um, but I didn't realize that everybody here was talking about a revolution, and revolutions are something that, you know, generally I find interesting, and when they relate to art, then this is definitely a community that I very much identify as a friend, an enjoyer, and an ally of, so diving deeper into this potential of a revolution, to me, seemed like a meaningful uh, thing to do and still sat at my computer, I decided, you know, I'm going to go um, and start looking for it. Um, how did I do that? I tried to find the timeline, the history, where did this uh, subversive potential sort of come up, and I went into this ancient prehistory um, almost 10 years before COVID is when it all started, a little bit with the beginning of the blockchain, people started to create art on the blockchain, and, you know, encoding artistic means uh, in Bitcoin blocks. There was conceptual art, including elements of the blockchain, be they miners or, or otherwise. There was also art about the blockchain, um, some of which, which has become uh, quite crude these days, so referencing cryptocurrency um, and these uh, systems. But really what I realized is that the, the, the revolution that I'd been seeing so much online uh, referenced a very specific subset um, of blockchain art or crypto art specifically, a subset that started around 2016 with um, the Rare Pepe project is where many um, point to the origins. Rare Pepe um, are uh, memes that are placed into cards. Anybody can create them and they're then co tokenized originally through Counterparty on Bitcoin, nowadays on Ethereum, and you can buy, sell, and trade um, these cards. So the, the sort of Rare Pepe movement, which is also very much concerned for anybody who's wondering, with reclaiming the Pepe narrative against its right wing sort of occupation on the internet was, um, was a really early signifier of um, what was to come later. I put on my favorite socks in honor of the occasion today. Um, and yeah, just something to keep in mind. So this was 2016 and then 2017. <coughs> Um, is an important year because that's really maybe um, where a lot of people say we saw the first type of projects that then came to, to be discussed in the revolution. These include the CryptoPunks. They themselves were not um, issued, so it's these little pixelated images, 10,000, um, uh, I guess there are in total. Um, they were not actually encoded in what we now know as NFTs, which is the standard that I referenced down there, ERC721. It's just a technical way of producing these tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but the CryptoPunks kind of came up, and also this other project, CryptoKitties, which for anybody who's not familiar with it, was really around um, breeding cats on the blockchain with <laughs> unique properties. And people got very, very excited about it. Um, excited to the extent that, you know, block space, something that Marios discussed yesterday, got crowded up. Um, and uh, people were astonished about the prices that people were willing to pay to get a really rare sort of cat um, to breed with their own. Maybe in Cyprus, unique rare cats uh, are less of a, of a surprise, but uh, to many they were, especially on the blockchain. And then in this ancient prehistory, I also want to reference an event that happened 
um, or maybe the standard now, it came between 2017 and 18. The CryptoKitties were in an early proto-standard implementation, so really interesting to see there. And then 2018 was really also the emergence of something like a community of people around these practices that started with the, with the Rare Pepes and some other projects in 2018 at the Rare, um, crypt, Rare Crypto Arts Festival in New York. Um, a lot of them gathered, and it was the first time that one of these cards, the Homer Pepe card that you can see over there, was um, sold in a live auction, um, not to anybody particularly interested in the arts per se, but to a Wall Street investor for around $300,000 at the time. Um, so that was the ancient prehistory, and then after that I was searching and searching, but you didn't see much in writing, and it was a time generally known as crypto winter, um, you know, where we turned to other things and stuff was bubbling in the background. That of course changed um, in the years of the pandemic around the time I was staring at my laptop, a story that we've heard several times yesterday. Um, I should have referenced maybe the Nyan Cat, another uh, prominent sale that came just before this Beeple 69 million um, sale in, in March where people went crazy. Uh, this was followed in April by uh, people like Paris Hilton, who was not actually late to the party, but already launched her iconic crypto queen, one of one rare card um, right there, the emergence of the, the um, Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, a widely discussed and maybe also criticized project in the circles that we are in now. Jack Dorsey showing that this is not necessarily about art by selling his first tweet for around $3 million. In May, I was very concerned because one of my favorite videos Charlie bit my finger, had been turned into an NFT, and I was wondering, will I be seeing this online? But, you know, that sort of experience also showed that maybe intellectual property and ownership are actually not so associated with the ownership of an NFT as we thought. Um, so, uh, thankfully, the, the video is, is still out there, and, you know, we can enjoy it whenever we want. Between May and November, I really tried to keep up, but um, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to call it a time of mayhem. Uh, chaos and madness, uh, as signified by the Disaster Girl meme, which of course also um, sold for horrendous prices, as Rosemary um, pointed out yesterday. And then um, another fun fact that is maybe not a sale is um, that by November, you know, this phenomenon had grown so big that Collins Dictionary actually voted NFT as their word of the year. And sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night um, today and I wonder, do they regret that now? Um, so this was a little bit my search for a revolution, but I realized pretty fast that in going down this rabbit hole, I was not learning about the history of a revolution, but more or less I was just mapping high prices over time, um, you know, which was kind of sad and um, brought me to um, the sad interlude. However, uh, as I am a PhD researcher, you know, I have a certain default um, actions that I um, fall back on, so I decided, frustrated, to close my search engine and turn to the academic discourse in search of the revolution. Um, what I found there um, was that people had written a bunch about this idea of use cases, so where can people be using blockchains and NFT specifically in the arts industries? Um, I read a bunch of things about um, how artists are um, adapting these new technologies in general, but also in various national industries like Australia or the UK. Um, I read uh, some stuff around the art funding, how has funding the arts changed thanks to the blockchain, um, vice versa, how has revenue through the arts changed through the blockchain for, for example, cultural institutions, the difference in ownership rights and intellectual property specifically associated um, with digital art on the blockchain. Um, and all of this was quite interesting, yet the overarching th theme uh, in the idea of funding, use cases, adoption, revenue, intellectual property and ownership was the idea of an art market and the question of how are NFTs revolutionizing not the arts, but the art market perhaps. Um, I was also surprised that a lot of this was quite conceptual, theoretical, normative, great. I, um, I learned a lot, but I found very little empirical. Um, I found one article, though, that um, I was very excited about, which is called here, A Blessing and a Curse, and it was really about unpacking these experiences that creators and artists had had um, 
with using these new technologies in various ways. And you know, they talked to a bunch of people, but in reading a little bit closer, um, what I discovered is that this article was really written in the time of mayhem, chaos, and madness, and thereby, you know, not for, for, for better or worse, uh, was mainly concerned in talking to people who had joined the crypto art space in that time specifically, was a lot of people from the creative industries who had maybe lost their jobs due to the COVID pandemic, and really the themes of using blockchain art as a means uh, for additional revenue and the market-facing dynamics, again, became sort of the foregrounded, um, foregrounded theme uh, in this empirical work itself. Um, all right, so although I learned a lot of interesting things, um, I was still annoyed that I hadn't found my revolution, but I had learned a lot about art markets and not really about the potential of technology for changing the art itself. Um, so after going through this disappointment and staring at my computer for you know many, many hours, I decided to maybe it's time to do what any reasonable person would have done before me now, which is just to talk. <laughs> To, um, to NFT artists and ask them uh, straight up. Um, so here I want to introduce, I was in a fortunate position to do so, uh, introducing this project Dada, uh, who are a historic crypto art community that I'm gonna uh, speak a little bit more to now, whom I've been doing ethnographic research with for more than 18 months now, very much not focused on the idea of NFTs and art, but really around DAOs and governance and uh, governance in transition and all these other things that you know uh, are my bread and butter usually. But they are really interesting people to talk to about the question of what is the role of these technologies for the arts beyond the art market for various reasons. Um, Dada is a platform. Um, they launched 2014 and it's a Web2 sort of thing. And the way it works is that one person um, starts, I can start drawing an image. Um, and this image could be, for example, about Limassol or Cyprus or um, birds or, you know, <laughs> uh, what have you. And anybody else can come in and reply to that image. And then more people can reply. And what happens is that conversations evolve through drawings, um, where each piece you know, is referring the, the piece before it, and you have these beautiful um, horizontally expanding strips uh, of artworks. Um, on this platform, there's tens of thousands of people who are drawing on it or um, have accounts. However, behind the platform, there's also an art collective. They call themselves the Dada Kin. Um, and they are uh, self-proclaimed sort of haters of the art market, which they very much uh, express through through a concept, philosophy, practice that they call the invisible economy, which is concerned with separating art making from the art market because they feel that true creativity cannot emerge if you're catering to a market and already have sort of the buyer and collector of your works in mind in creating that sort of thing and really rethinking alternative economic structures to support artists in creating without the art market looming in the background. Um, so therefore, you know, they're, they're interesting in just talking beyond the art market because they don't like that. Um, and they're also interesting as a crypto project or experience uh, within this NFT industry beyond the empirical um, sort of research that we have from now who came after the crypto winter because Dada was one of these pioneering projects who launched their first NFT collection in 2017 um, it was not yet on this ERC-721 standard. It was very much in collaboration with the crypto punks who, you know, um, they were friends with who helped them in adapting a few smart contracts to put it out there. They since then have, you know, launched numerous other NFT collections. They went through that experience of selling absolutely nothing through in, during the crypto winter, experienced the boom and burst, et cetera. So there's quite an historical experience um, to share within this community, and therefore I thought it would make sense to just go talk to them and ask. Um, I obviously did not just ask. <laughs> I uh, severely overcomplicated things and turned this into a little research project um, that I'm going to talk about now. Uh, there was a bunch of methods involved. Uh, the first thing that I did is that I didn't just want to talk to Dada people, but I thought Dada people were a really great starting point to be having this conversation. So I used this snowball technique where every person that I talked to, you know, would refer me to various others and I tried to contact them. And through that, I kind of developed a network of talking to especially like a historic 
crypto art community that Dada is very much embedded in. I did um, online interviews, semi-structured. Um, some of them lasted, most of them around an hour, some of them way longer. I tried to use the similar questions as the previous research, just because that's what you taught as a researcher, to make it a little bit comparable and it makes, it makes sense, but really emphasizing sort of the aspect of the role of NFTs beyond the market. Um, in terms of demographics, I didn't ask if they're, you know, girls or boys, but I did want to try and identify uh, some, some uh, markers around who are the people that I'm talking to. Uh, interestingly, in the previous study that I mentioned, there was a lot of talk about a separation between an artist, a collector, a technologist, that sort of thing. Every single person I spoke to, I think there was uh, 11 in total, um, in this research, did not identify with any one of those roles. Every single one of them had created something, had minted an NFT before, had collected uh, other people's work, had been involved in gifting um, NFTs, etc. And they uh, just straight up rejected sort of that notion of there being a difference. Um, it was also interesting, and this was something um, that Natalie and I were discussing over lunch yesterday, the various backgrounds that these people came from. So some of them were really artists who went to fine art school and had been living as, as artists all their life and now exploring this new technology. Other people had maybe had a creative background but then worked more as a graphic designer or a creative for hire um, in that sort of sense. Um, you know, others uh, had dabbled with technology, then collaborated with others, and therefore also the mediums that people were, were using uh, were very diverse. It went from DJing to VJing to performance to digital sculpting to photography um, to animation. So, so all sorts of um, mediums and art forms were included in this, and one common denominator though was that they all had had some sort of experience with the art market previously, they disliked that experience, there was hope for something different, and they'd all joined before the pandemic uh, into this sort of uh, environment. Um, all right, so beyond the demographics, what did I find? Um, and what is the role, maybe, according to these people, of NFTs and art beyond the market? The first one that I already alluded to a little bit uh, in the demographic introduction is this idea of NFTs as a tool for systemic change. Um, and I want to connect that a little bit to what Barbara said about the radical imagination that somehow these technologies are sparking in various communities. And I think um, without having a, a very specific example, I did generally get these stories about like, wow, I learned about it and my brain started thinking that things could be different. And that's what I was excited about, and the atmosphere uh, in joining those early communities was that same atmosphere that everybody believed that we can really change systemic dynamics here. Um, there was obviously a lot of disappointment by the time that I spoke with people. Some were completely disillusioned. To your question, Claire, should we abandon this? Some said yes, many said, you know, no, there is still something here, but, and we have an obligation, right, to care for the people who care to explore that something. Um, Another maybe more technical aspect that uh, people highlighted in this role of sy systemic change of NFTs is that they said that, you know, um, NFTs were really decoupling something that we believe is, you know, a core feature of ownership in the physical world, which is this idea of access. If I buy a physical Picasso and decide to hang it over my toilet, well, you know, I've just restricted access to 99.9% .9 of all people to enjoy this cultural good. But here, as this quote sort of signifies, it's the art is part of a commons and a culture that needs to be accessible to all people, which does not mean that, you know, they cannot be an, an ownership aspect. But by decoupling ownership and aspect, we are fundamentally, in a subversive way, changing a market, uh, and that there is some potential here that I thought was interesting to bring up in the context of this conference. So um, as a takeaway, it's kind of like the idea that right-click save is a feature not a bug. Um, a second finding that I had, and maybe you know, I named it in this little more uh, crude way, is that NFTs were discussed as a new way to community, something that Barbara um, termed socially engaged practice, you know, which made a lot of sense to me, and maybe I should have changed it. But um, a new way to community in, in two ways were anecdotes that I uh, heard about. The one was a token of appreciation. Here's an anecdote of, you know, people collecting each other's work and that sort of being the, the starting point of, of 
talking to each other and building long-term relationships. This was not the, the only, um, you know, this type of experience that people shared, but I had a lot of stories where, uh, where artists expressed the meaningfulness of somebody collecting their NFTs and them also reaching out, especially, you know, if this was not generative art with low effort, but meaningful pieces that they put out there. Um, and sort of the, the networks that they had gained through NFT production and collection. Uh, another really funny story that I wanted to share here is how communities emerged across maybe unconventional boundaries. So one um, person that I spoke to, you know, is uh, a 60 year old uh, punk who uh, started, who is, you know, uh, an artist in creating incredible uh, works, but is also a, a connoisseur of, you know, fun and silly projects um, and joined a Discord server called the, the Idiots, I think it was. Um, and on the Idiots Discord server, having very deep and meaningful conversations with people who transpired to be, you know, very much not their own age uh, in a sort of happening uh, of community that would maybe in physical spaces or other spaces just not uh, have, uh, have happened. And this socially engaged practice of collecting and uh, gathering around certain NFTs making that possible. Um, a third thing that I found, the third role, is NFTs as a ritual artifact, and that is their role and meaning maybe in art. And the, the first one here uh, was the ritual of gifting, um, which I'm just going to place because it is maybe still a socially engaged practice. Um, for example, the story that somebody shared very early on when they received uh, CryptoPunk as a gift and the experience of having that as their first NFT and the experience that previously there was just not uh, a way of maybe gifting in such a, you know, there's an added aspect to gifting an NFT than sending over a JPEG or a screenshot on your, um, on your WhatsApp feed. And uh, sharing this experience and that it was a powerful thing uh, was something, you know, that, that also came up quite a bit. And it was also something that I realized is like a very normal thing that people who have been in crypto art for a while, they, they gift each other things. And that's how collections build up. And, you know, this is not unique to crypto artists, but I guess artists uh, historically have always done that. But it's interesting to see in this, uh, in this new space. Uh, and with this new sort of tool. Um, another meaning of ritual was really the blockchain as a ritual. Uh, and I th thought this was very, very interesting. It's what is the meaning of, of NFTs and blockchains for art? Well, it's a ritual artifact. So just like there's holy water in the church, which is physically not very different. Uh, it took me a while to find that out. I always thought it was something special, but it's just normal water that has undergone a ritual, right? And by undergoing that ritual, it hasn't changed its physical property, but it has acquired for a certain subset of people uh, an added sort of meaning. And here somebody was telling me about, you know, consensus and itching on blockchains as that sort of ritual, which does not change the work itself. But by having done it, you look at the work differently thereafter. Um, this was kind of also echoed by people being very thoughtful about what they, you know, would turn into an NFT and, and put on the blockchain. Um, fourth, there was this idea of NFTs as a means for preservation. This was maybe a little bit of, um, uh, I don't want to call it naive, but an aspirational thing that people told me in their first encounter with the blockchain, that people were worried about what is going to happen, especially to my digital artworks when I die and I stop paying my server hosting um, sort of fees and whatnot. And the idea of being able to leave archaeological traces of um, of their works on this ledger that somehow is believed, you know, to be more durable um, digital infrastructure. And there was also some ideas around like anchoring, you know, not just remnants, but also some context that would give art historical meaning then um, to the works and sort of facilitate uh, verification and whatnot that is, that is done in many cultural institutions today. And, you know, uh, I thought it was interesting, and I just want to mention that there's a bunch of projects like very actively exploring this role now, which was a role that really declined when people were like, uh, but the blockchain is not good as, you know, a database for saving things. Um, well, you know, uh, I think this is very much an ongoing, ongoing work that we shouldn't negate. And then last but not least, something that I think is uh, uh, super interesting is the idea of art uh, or NFTs as a new medium. So rather than NFTs as a container or canvas solely um, to embed them in an artistic medium at the time. And um, I heard a bunch of examples, but I wanted to highlight um, three during this talk. One of them um, 
is a talk that I really recommend from Paul Seidler, uh, who gave this at Trust, you know, I think maybe half a year ago or so. He's one of the co-founders of Terra Zero, and he's really somebody, one of the few people that I know of, you know, exploring smart contracts as an artistic medium themselves, um, somebody who very much criticizes uh, this idea that NFTs would be it, NFTs are a technical standard, the ERC-721 was built by people who are not artists who never, you know, maybe thought about that as an artistic medium or, or use case, it's just a token standard, why are we so obsessed with it, let's explore um, this sort of potential. I also want to um, give a shout out to Async Art, which came up again and again, Async Art less than a month ago, unfortunately, and I think that's also something that gives the urgency uh, and some seriousness to the talk, they decided they had to shut down. Async Art was one of the few platforms that, um, in my understanding, was really experimenting and, and pushing new uses of these technologies. For example, the first supper is uh, the idea of a collaborative work. I'm not sure how many people collaborated. Uh, here, there's 13 artists, and they all drew layers. And the idea is that NFTs and blockchains are used in tracing the remixability and the layers that people have added, so thereby by um, also then automatically distributing royalties among those layers and the remixing in resales, you know, legitimizing this practice of remixing, which has um, traditionally been uh, something you know that people call out for intellectual property, but is very commonplace in our digital space. Um, you know, async was also a place where people would start experimenting with programmable art on the blockchain. Um, here, this, this image, you know, changes according to the price of, of Bitcoin, where maybe this is not the most groundbreaking, but the idea of uh, linking uh, artworks to outside conditions as enforced by oracles and smart contracts, you know, that is something, again, that is interesting that we don't think about when we talk about the board apes. Um, yeah, so, so what? <laughs> um, going maybe back to, to the, the question uh, that Gerd asked at the beginning is, is there still subversive potential? Is there anything here? Does it matter? Um, should we abandon crypto art or abandon the space? Or, uh, you know, dive, dive deeper um, or continue <laughs> uh, staying on this maybe sinking ship? Who knows? Um, and I was thinking about this last night and I was thinking, you know, the one core insight for me is that the technology itself is probably not subversive. I doubt any technology has ever been born as a subversive thing, but it is usually around the way that people use those technologies that can um, be subversive. As we heard about Telegram in Hong Kong, um, you know, Twitter in the Arab Spring, um, etc. I think uh, we've seen sub subversive uses or interesting uses from the, from the Daria case um, that, that Barbara uh, presented, the idea of unmaking in you know, industrial productive cycles, um, empty image spaces as you know, new iterations of the image, um, the stuff that Dada is doing, I still think is very inspiring. And, but we also know that all these projects are really under pressure um, and including data, there is not a lot of funding, like it's a hard time for everybody. Somebody showed this investment chart. And for me, sort of the so what is that caring about people who are using these technologies in subversive ways is um, to myself as somebody who, you know, is friendly and feels like an ally to them is a responsibility um, of care that I think I have and I would hope others feel um, as well. Um, and in showing this responsibility of care towards subversive practices with NFTs and blockchain technologies, I think what we're doing is, you know, really trying to uh, amplify or maybe not amplify to the net mainstream, but network in useful places the, these affordances of technologies that are maybe, you know, that would not pop up in my original internet search looking for um, the revolution. I want to shout out here to some work by uh, you know, friend and colleague Laura Lotti, who wrote about the, the fact of the art of tokenization and uh, the risks that come if we continuously focus both as practitioners and researchers in exploring the market affordances and the financial affordances in art of these technologies. So sort of echoing that, I say, if we don't explore the alternative, um, who will? Um, 
And then another thing reflecting, I was obviously in doing this talk listening to Tracy Chapman a lot. Um, and then I was actually listening and then she uh, says, you know, talking about a revolution, I was like, oh, stupid. It's not going to be on artbasel.com <laughs> because it's like a whisper. So I think spaces like that and maybe also I guess that's what Money Lab uh, Original, the original intention was is to create this alternative space for that discourse and that network. Um, so my research journey uh, of excitement for the revolution took me a little bit from yay to, to, to bro with cigarette, but I hope in continuing to show radical care for those who do um, work on things that we believe that matter and we know and we see it, um, you know, kind of to, to have another second glow up uh, of this space. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I did write an article around this research that was recently published. Um, there's more stuff in it, there's less memes though, so um, read if you like. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>